Hey everyone, I'm Jay. And I'm Sean. And we watched a movie. Can you guess which one? Well, if they read the title, they can. I guess that's true. <laughs> I hate to say it, <laughs> but it's Beetlejuice. 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 tell by the fact that I own a Beetlejuice dress, one of my favorite movies, um, from 1988. And I still can't quite believe how old it is. And it's older than I even thought. Obviously, it was uh, very popular when I was a little girl in the sleepover circuit, because it was like renting a horror movie, and yet it is rated PG. Somehow. That's so very, very mysterious. Yes. And it wasn't the only one. There was a time around, I think, in between 86 and 88, where movies like Airplane, and there's a couple of movies that got to say the F word once without paying the PG-13 price. Uh, it is a total mystery how that happened, and I don't think it happens anymore. But this is one of those movies. It does have an F word, but it is a PG rated horror film it's not it's not scary it's dark but when you're a little kid you feel like you're getting away with something because you can convince your mom to watch it but oh you get to cuddle tight downstairs when you're watching it with your friends in your little sleeping bags uh particularly terrible because in the waiting room of death there is somebody in a sleeping bag with a snake who clearly has died of a snake in the sleeping bag Oh, I didn't notice that. So, well, you don't notice anything. <laughs> Did you notice <laughs> my makeup today? Yes. We've been uh, testing Sean lately. <laughs> uh, when I was make up like a zombie, zombie, he didn't notice. Well, I liked your eyes. You thought I was a pretty girl. <laughs> you are a pretty yeah. girl. You're a pretty uh, zombie. You're a pretty mm -hmm. Beetlejuice. You're a pretty lady. Well, I would say I'm more inspired by Lydia Dietz in this look. Makes sense. Look. <laughs> or you think I'm a Beetlejuice. That guy is moldy. He's literally his face is moldy. That's true. <laughs> you just gotta be offensive no matter what. <laughs> so I'll be spoiling my mood. <laughs> my goodness. So yeah, 1988. I can't believe how old this movie is. So it was super old even when we were watching it as kids. But it well, was... Uh... you, not me. <laughs> okay, true. A little less for you. Yeah. But still 88. Even you were still a kid. I was still a kid. Um, I saw this as a kid. I watched the yeah. cartoon as a kid. Yes, that's right. We watched it too. Uh, good stuff, that Beetlejuice. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was a big deal. It was a big this deal. This was a, as you said, a big movie to watch. Mm -hmm. And you did feel like you're getting away with something. Mm -hmm. It was a little horror junior. Yeah, it was. I mean, certainly all of that death. I mean, they're not sugarcoating stuff. Uh, as they say in the movie, suicides go to civil service. <laughs> and that does appear to be true. It does. Which makes you wonder, because we do find out that the social worker, uh, Beetlejuice used to be her assistant. So by that rule, he also is a suicide. We don't quite get into his painful past. No. Maybe that was for the sequel. Um, in this movie, in fact, Michael Keaton is wonderful. He is. This is his favorite role of his. He is maniacally unhinged, and it's wonderful to see him. But he's really only on screen like 20 minutes of the whole film. It's a lot of Alec Baldwin <laughs> and Gina Davis. Yes. So they play a young married couple who are having a staycation, but it's back in the 80s when they don't know what to call it that yet. Um, and then they go get into a car accident because of a stray dog and they drown. Uh, but very shortly thereafter, they show up back at their house sopping wet and uh, they don't remember how they got there. And then they find the handbook for the recently deceased and they start piecing things together. They don't have um, a mirror reflection anymore. They come they can't to realize go out of the house. they can't go out of the house without something terrible happening. They end up in like some sand place. Where did With you think it was? Worm. Oh, on your video game. Yeah, I thought it was more side. like Doom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah, it's not a great place to be. No, it's not. I mean, neither is your house for the next 100 years, which is, I don't know, the arbitrary number they believe they have to be there yeah. for whatever reason. Particularly not when a new family moves into their house. And boy, they really do get upset about that. Well, Even rightly that so. Is... No one wants Jeffrey Jones in their neighborhood. <laughs> no. I mean, we clearly didn't know that yet. Yeah. Uh, that does put a different twist on everything. Yeah, it does. But yeah, they're very upset that a new family, and a weird family, the Dietzes are not your everyday well, they're family. they're super weird. Yeah, because Charles, played by Jeffrey Jones, is like a guy who keeps reminding us that he moved out here for some peace and quiet so you know he must have had some kind of mental breakdown or yep. something to need all this peace and quiet because he's just like a middle-aged guy and then there is style icon my very favorite ms delia deets artiste played by katherine o'hara who i love to pieces how can you not she's pretty much my favorite thing ever uh, and I, in this m movie, I have to say, only now do I start thinking that Delia Dietz is Moira Rose Light. Yeah. Like, I think she was working up <laughs> to some Moira Roseness. And their daughter, the strange, the unusual, Lydia Dietz, played by Winona Ryder. Now, how old would you say Lydia Dietz is? Like 13. Okay, because Winona Ryder is 17 when she's playing her. But she is referred to as a little girl. And they are trying to make her look young but not innocent. She's a little goth girl. God love her. Uh, certainly when you think of this being made in the 80s, when all the other te teenagers would be wearing like neon yeah. windbreakers and waterfall bangs and she is wearing like black veils and like <laughs> pc bangs and you just have to love her no wonder she became like a cultural icon to every girl who thought themselves to be a little strange and a little unusual uh so yes michael keaton's favorite movie of his he ad-libbed like 90 percent of the lines uh, Alec Baldwin's least favorite movie of his, he thought he did a pretty crummy job. He does not like watching his performance in that movie. I'm with him on that. Ooh, I just ooh, feel like he really just doesn't bring much. He does not bring much. There's no personality to this guy at all. Uh, granted, he is dead, <laughs> but it's really Gina Davis. And she kind of feels like a maternal bond with Lydia Dietz, who it turns Absolutely. out can see them. And she's the only human who can really see them. So uh, because they don't really like sharing their home with this family, they initially try spooking them away. And that doesn't work, especially around this goth prone family they, who enjoy this kind of thing. And it, yeah, they you know, view it as uh, something they can maybe make, <laughs> make money, money off, off of. of. Yes. And Lydia Dietz just loves it. And in fact, maybe would prefer to be dead herself. So like I said, Barbara, Gina Davis, really kind of has a maternal bond with her. We know she didn't have children in life. And she really responds to Lydia. <laughs> they get along very well. And so she starts to feel a little bit bad about this haunting of the family house. Um, but I have to say, the haunting is so much fun. Uh, they are not great at it. Their social worker sort of tells them how bad they are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they eventually resort to hiring uh, a contract worker. Now, we know what to do if the house is haunted. We will call an exorcist. But what happens if you are the ghost and you want to rid the house of humans? Who do you call? Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, who I think calls himself a bio-exorcist or something like something that. Something like that. He's going to rid the house of humans by doing what he does best, being gross and scary. So he claims just because he's been dead for so long, and we don't really know exactly how long, but he's been Must dead been a while. for long enough to have gone moldy. Uh, and he is going to scare these people out. Uh, so he tries, like, snakes. He likes snakes. He, li he does like snakes. Not everybody does, but uh, he tries a lot of different tacks. And maybe would have even been successful. Probably. Um, <laughs> but yes, like we said, 
our dear Adam and Barbara are just not that good at this. In fact, they, their haunting, their best haunting is the film's, I think, most iconic scene, the dinner party in which they inhabit the, the guests and sing the banana boat song, Deo. Um, Tim Burton wanted to cut the scene. He thought, this isn't funny, what will audiences think? He just didn't think it belonged there. And yet, when they had test audiences in, that's the scene they came away talking about. And certainly it is the scene we all remember. Yeah. So it may not have been exactly funny, but it is certainly entertaining. Yes, it is. Um, and definitely helped, especially by Catherine O'Hara, who is the first and most yeah. uh, used in this scene. Something is taking over her body, and now she's lip syncing to a Calypso song. And so we see her very surprised by this, uh, worried about it. <laughs> we see so much over her face, but her body and her lips are just performing the song. So I think it does take a special someone to bring that to life and make us appreciate both sides of what's happening. And yet she has never over the top terrified by it and then we do find out afterwards that everyone has thought this is great fun and how can they monetize it <laughs> because everyone will want this super fun time at their next at their dinner, dinner party. party yeah <sighs> boy so uh, i mean i love this movie i have loved it obviously for many years uh and i like all the little bits and pieces in it um beetlejuice is a name that the studio really fought over. Of course, we see the real spelling of Beetlejuice, which is a constellation in the movie, but the movie's title is like an Americanized spelling of it. So everyone wouldn't argue over how I to pronounce, pronounce it. it. Um, so the studio was like, I don't know if we love this. How about House of Ghosts? Ugh. And this, I think, House of Ghosts is just a sort of blah name. For no. what is really a unique and bizarre movie. Yeah, it is. It had to be Beetlejuice. Yes. Well, Tim Burton hit back and suggested Scared Sheetless. Um, he uh, went with what he thought was the worst possible name in order to gain favor to his other choice. A popular <laughs> psychology trick which backfired on him because the studio exact of studio course, life. thought it was pretty great. <laughs> so it's a minor miracle that they landed back on Beetlejuice and maybe the spelling is the thing that tipped it over. Thank goodness. Um, did you know that this movie was the first DVD that Netflix ever sent out way back in 1998? Funny. Yes. So it was already the movie itself, 10 years old at that point. Subscriber number one, where they just <laughs> wanted some Beetlejuice. Yes, <laughs> which is a weird thing, but great. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love Beetlejuice? Yeah. I mean, I have a copy myself, so unnecessary to resort to Netflix. But I also think it's funny to remember that that's how Netflix started out. It was a, well, a you were snail a Netflix mail. subscriber at one time. I was, that's right. I worked overnight. And so I needed a lot of movies to get me through those overnights. Guess how you become a movie critic, guys. <laughs> you watch, watch an movies. absurd amount of movies. So many that I did send away for DVDs that would arrive in my mailbox. And then you watch them and then you send them back and you keep a list. It was a crazy system. I can't believe it worked. It was basically like a global movie library. And uh, yeah, watched a lot of movies that way. Uh, but was really glad when they converted to digital. <laughs> it, yeah. it makes a lot more sense. It's way easier. Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of sort of sad and real touches of death, uh, aside from like the sleeping bag with the snake, and there's like a shark attacked victim in the waiting room. The shark is in there too, so apparently they both <laughs> died from this encounter. Um, a magician's assistant oh, who was like saw in half. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of uh, uh, a smoker who was burned guy. up. Oh yeah, the <laughs> smoker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's up with the shrunken head? Did he shoot? He looked like a hunter. So did he shoot his head off? And that's why he only has a tiny head no, now? No, it looks like he was uh, 
had a problem with the witch doctor. Okay. So I guess after his head was shrunk and maybe he still didn't learn his lesson. Oh. So has something <laughs> else had to happen. I see. Okay. We're going way back. Yeah. Um, so the receptionist who is Miss Argentina, Argentina. according to her sash, uh, is green. But she died by suicide. We see her slashed wrists. So why is she green? I don't know. We, we're not sure. No. Gang uh, green? <laughs> we also see a guy who, again, a civil servant, so he must have jumped off a building. Now he's completely flat. Oh, yeah. Poor guy. Uh, so you can really play a weird game of bingo just by identifying the different methods of death. In fact, the only people in the movie who don't look the way they looked when they died are Barbara and Adam, because Tim Burton just thought it would be way too miserable to make them be wet all of the time. Mm. So luckily for the actors, they got to be dry. Um, but in those like waiting room scenes, we do hear uh, like flight 409 is arriving at gate three. Uh, flight 409 is a real flight, uh, United Airlines, that crashed in a mountain in Wyoming. This was back in 1955 and everyone on board died. So that is a whole flight of people coming in. And I think another flight of people had just arrived because we see a whole football team oh, yeah. harassing. Uh, and they come to understand that maybe they didn't survive their crash either. In 1970, 37 football players from Marshall University died oh, yeah. on Southern Air Airways. Um, so 37 football players, eight coaching staff, and 25 boosters aboard that plane that all died. So yeah, those, the football team really need a men's room. <laughs> they're really harassing the assistant and they're just starting to realize that they did not survive the crash. Uh, and they all died having to pee, apparently. And I know I will too, yeah, no matter how are. I die. Do you ever think about that? Do you have like a, a favorite method of death you'd prefer to go by? Not peacefully in your sleep, because I'm sure everyone <laughs> wants that. I not me, I want to make like, a grand exit. Yeah. But. I haven't planned it. Okay. Well, I know you haven't planned it. <laughs> you don't have a preferred method. No. Okay. Boring. I just have ones that I don't <laughs> want to have happen. <laughs> sure. So uh, Tim Burton's first choice for a production designer was Anton First, who had done Full Metal Jacket. But unfortunately, he was busy on some other commitment, which turned out to be hella boring compared to Beetlejuice. But uh, that gap did allow Tim Burton to hire Bo Welch, the production designer, for the first time. They would go on to work together quite a bit in the future, including Edward Scissorhands and Batman Returns, notably. Um, so they were all over New England lo scouting locations together and stuff, and he was on set, but he is a behind the scenes guy. It wasn't until end of production when Tim Burton gave him some unsolicited dating advice. In fact, he prodded him to ask out a member of the cast. Uh, and Bo Welch didn't feel like he had any place talking to the talent, but he got his nerve up and asked out Catherine O'Hara. And you know what? Aim big if you're gonna do it. Uh, they have been married since 1992. So it worked out. It worked it out. It worked out. But yeah, it was Tim Burton who gave who the, that connection. the yeah. nudge and the prod there. Yeah. Um, so, the sequel. Is it a go? Probably not. Uh, but we have been talking about a sequel to this movie for 30 years. Uh, and there was, uh, what's that called? There was a script in production. <laughs> You're gonna love it. Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian. Don't love it. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, the Dietzes would have moved to Hawaii to develop a resort and Beetlejuice would follow because they are digging up, I think, old graves. So uh, I, both Michael Keaton and Winona Ryder were signed on again, but the script just kept stalling out and uh, Tim Burton lost his interest, I guess, his excitement for it and started developing Batman. So then Michael Keaton and Tim Burton were busy with other things. But that script just kept, like, people just love this movie so much. The script just kept 
going and even as late as just a few years ago they keep dusting it off and then it goes back on the shelf and I think everyone involved would do it but would only you know would do it if it's, if it's really good. good yeah yeah I think everyone would this yeah. is one of those movies mm -hmm. that people could make mm -hmm. 30 years later yeah but <laughs> Clearly, they don't have the right script. Yeah. Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian <laughs> does not sound like the one that should be made. Do they need to go tropical yet? It's, that seems like for number five or six. <laughs> but of course, uh, as, a, as the undead, he could, I mean, he won't have aged. He's just been hanging around for millennia. Yep. He definitely could have a lot of hauntings and a lot of stories to tell. Will he get to tell it? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Um, so Tim Burton, this movie was made on a relatively small budget of $15 million, only 1 million of which was allotted to visual effects. Uh, so Tim Burton immediately decided to leverage that and make it work as much as it could by doing the tackiest and most B movie effects that he could. He wanted to intentionally make it look bad. Uh, because it added to the creepiness factor and to Beetlejuice's sort of unique world. And certainly we do see him, like he is living partially in a model of the town. He is living partially in his coffin when we first meet him. But he has the ability to pop all over the place. Uh, and there are a lot of creepy things, creepy faces and masks. There's enough to give you the, like, the willies when you're a kid, at least. Um, I, so it's kind of um, interesting that he decided to take it that way. It is. I think it was the right choice. And mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't have been PG hmm. if the yeah. effects had been more Actually, real. Actually, yeah. So they were judicious about what they showed and what they didn't. And that always works well because then your own imagination <laughs> subs in yeah. what you don't see. Um, Michael Keaton based the character of Beetlejuice after Chop Top from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Uh, a movie I have not seen. No, neither have I. I'm surprised Michael Keaton went to see it and liked it so much. He went after this maniacal... Uh, a character he contributed a lot to himself. Like, he knew where he wanted with the teeth and the hair and it's such a out of this world he is an unsightly gentleman sure he is he is also an unlikable guy absolutely so i think it is kind of brilliant that they've used him very sparingly because we never get tired of a shtick we're not totally repulsed by him because he's so interesting but only about 20 minutes of screen time for the film's namesake star that is an interesting way to go but i really like how they they use him. Yeah. You always leave them wanting more, right? That's right. That is right. He And he just does pop up unexpectedly. So, um, of course, Adelia's wardrobe. You know, I am a big fan. I do think she is a style icon. We haven't spoken enough about Ms. Delia. Um, but her, the costume designer did not even get an Oscar nod, which I think that's a big it's omission. It is. Aggie Rogers deserved it. Yep. Um, so she was using a lot of Japanese designers for Ms. Dietz, uh, Mitsu Hiro Matsuda, and I say Miyaki, and Comme des Garçons. Uh, but she uses also pieces of clothing, wearing them in a way that that clothing is not intended for. One of the first times we meet her, she's wearing a hairband, but it is made out of gloves. You can see like the fingers. Oh, yeah. uh, another time, she's wearing her husband's sweater. So we do see Charles wearing the red sweater earlier. She is wearing it now as a pair of pants held up by suspenders. So <laughs> you just, she, we know how unique and she does definitely believe herself to be an artiste. Very much so. She's an artiste. Yes. Even though Even all her sculptures are terrible. <laughs> yes, her agent does suggest he's been losing money on them, which is uncharitable to say that to her <laughs> face, really. But anyways, I do really love the costumes, and I love Delia Dietz. We can 
really afford to lose Charles. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess he's funding this whole thing, but he's a stick in the mud. Aside from the actor also being a pedophile. Yeah. Uh, so it was down to Winona Ryder and Alyssa Milano for the role of Lydia Dietz. Yeah. Now, Sean, at the time, who did you have the bigger crush on? Definitely Alyssa Milano. Oh, okay. Yeah. Definitely. I see. I see. But so Winona I, Ryder is the right choice. Yeah, of course she is. Because she does always, like... She does this whole weird thing mm -hmm. in a number of movies. Yeah. yeah. So towards the end of the movie, Beetlejuice is forcing Lydia into marriage. Which, I mean, obviously we think of her yet as a young girl. Perhaps Beetlejuice comes from an era where she is not too young. But certainly they are strangers. <laughs> it's a weird and upsetting turn of events. It is. Uh, but what is not what is wonderful is her bridal gown. Oh yeah, the red thing. The red dress. Yeah. Of course, popular lore always said that if you were wed in red, you'd wish yourself dead. And she did. And she is suicidal, yes. Poor girl. Uh, is she suffering from depression and nobody can even say it? I mean, her mother does say, well, you were miserable in New York. You can be miserable here. So it's like they know. They know. They don't care. I don't know. Maybe in the 80s we weren't diagnosing. We didn't care about mental health yet. Well, also her family is terrible, which yeah. is part of well, the Well, none thing. of them are really looking after her. They're yeah. very self-involved people. And when the movie ends, it does seem... <laughs> they seem to be all coexisting in the house together, but it does seem that the dead couple is in charge of raising Lydia. Yeah, yeah, that she just <laughs> spends all her time with them. Yes. And they ask her about how her grades are. Mm -hmm. So I guess they're making it work. It takes a village. It's a modern family. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, I'm mad for Aggie Rogers that she didn't have an Oscar nomination at least, but the makeup people did. In fact, they won. Good. So, V. Neal, Steve Laporte, and Robert Short. Um, they were up against Scrooged and Coming to America. So, I mean, I love those movies too, but yeah. makeup-wise, I think this is the standout contender. Absolutely. So I'm very glad that they at least got some love. Um, Tim Burton got this script because <laughs> After Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, it made him a bankable director. That is the movie that really gave him that was a, a name movie. and a start. That's hard for me to imagine. Like, I don't really know Pee-wee. Like, that's yeah. too old for me, I guess. Yeah. But... Well, it was a... <laughs> it came and went. Yeah. But it was a big deal in the 80s. It really okay. was. See, I didn't really even know that there was a movie. Like, I knew there was a TV show. The TV show was also a big deal, mm -hmm. but it all started with Pee-wee's Big okay. Adventure. Well, I didn't really know that at the time. And, and I it guess was I another one of those now. movies where it was so different from mm -hmm. what had come, mm -hmm. where it was totally a kid's movie mm -hmm. that was a little risque. Mm-hmm. We got on board. Yes, we did. Uh, that is the mind of Tim Burton. And so because he was suddenly the IT director, he was getting a lot of scripts, but finding a lot of them just too normal, too commonplace, he wasn't excited by them, which is when he started developing his own Batman. But eventually he got this script and he knew there was potential there. There was, there was room to put some good Tim Burton spin. This is really uh, the start of Tim Burton's gothic <laughs> yes. imagery mm -hmm. that he then carries through in every Everything. movie since. <laughs> yes. He does create this... Uh, I mean, the universes are different in every movie, and yet he does have an aesthetic that he brings to projects that make it identifiably his. And yeah, we are already seeing it in 1988 with Beetlejuice. Um, obviously, he has certain muses that he likes to work with. Michael Keaton was one of them, which yep. is great. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. Uh, I can't believe him in this role. It is so much fun. And it's just thinking about the other movies around it at that time. This is such a standout just for him to play this character. 
They had such a hard time getting anyone to say yes to this role. Like big, big, big names in Hollywood all turned it down. And it was finally Michael Keaton who thought, oh, I think I can do this. I think I can make it fun. So in conclusion, we love <laughs> Beetlejuice. How Isn't can you not right? love Beetlejuice? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Love it. Um, another movie we love, uh, not coincidentally, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yes. Yes. So, no, we're still not talking about it because that one's coming out October 28th. Keep a watch. But we do have some giveaway winners, Nightmare Before Christmas giveaway winners. So you may remember we had two prize packs, a Sally and a Jack. So... So who won? Sally goes to a matter of Disney taste. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm happy for you. I hope you see this. Uh, our about page has our email address. So let us know where we can send your package. She is on a weird hiatus on her channel right now. She was reviewing really great lounge fly Disney backpacks. Uh, oh, but those it, are cool. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah. Can't, I will not buy one because then I know You'd I will never stop. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're pricey. <laughs> uh, but I, I loved it when she was reviewing them, but she's taking a little hiatus. Obviously, she's still around and commenting. We appreciate it. Uh, Jack is going to Eccentric Nature. So you should definitely drop by his page. Eric talks about herbs. He grows them. He knows all about them. He will teach you about them, go into the myths, their medicinal uses, the whole thing. You will not It's pretty fitting, but really, he yes. should have gotten the Sally. Well, that's her thing. <laughs> You're right. And in fact, I think he commented twice for, for both. Okay. Uh, but he gets the Jack. He got the Jack, yeah. But you're right. That is a funny... It's true. She is kind of like into potent potables. Yep. <laughs> the nightshade. <laughs> you gotta watch that, Sally. You do. She'll you sneak that in keep your Keep your seat. eye on her. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely check him out. You will not believe how interesting he can make all of these herbs sound. So, those are our two lucky prize winners this month. And congratulations to congratulations both. Congratulations to both. Uh, but if you didn't win, we're so sorry, but there will be another giveaway soon, so stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.